1865 was a crucial year on the island of Jamaica. What happened in the last part of 1864 and the first part of 1865 would nearly tear the country apart. Unexpected changes had pushed the society into tension and what felt like a constant state of pressure. First, the price of sugar had collapsed. You see, Jamaica was a sugar-producing colony and a significant amount of the jobs and economic growth were linked to their ability to keep producing sugar. Sugar was still in demand, but now that the workers had to get paid, among other things, it was starting to cost more to produce sugar than it could be sold for. Also, there were pandemics and widespread disease. Smallpox and typhoid fever were also common during this time. There was a particularly devastating smallpox outbreak from 1851 to 1852, which had claimed many lives. On top of that, the American Civil War raged on. This had affected the supply of many of the essential goods which were usually imported into the island. This created scarcity, which sent the price of imported goods up, and the overall cost of living would shift upwards rapidly as well. The average person on the island did not earn enough from working to regularly provide for the basic needs of their family. The Falmouth Post, a newspaper, reported on growing poverty in the midst of us. The lamentation over the material decadence of the country is almost undeniable. During the 1860s, there was a severe drought which had hit the island. The drought was so severe that many planters feared the loss of a significant amount of investment worth millions of pounds. The Falmouth Post reported on April 25, 1865, that if the drought did not resolve itself soon, the manufacture of sugar and rum in Jamaica would soon be a thing of the past. Our prospects are very bad. Not a drop of rain. Crops are short and plants for next year are suffering materially. Poor Jamaica. What is to be done with bad seasons, bad returns, and bad prices? Even though the press was known for exaggeration, these comments showed how serious the situation was. Food production was drastically reduced, and of course, this had the ripple effect of making food prices go up everywhere. And stealing food became an everyday occurrence. To cope with the abolition of slavery and the increased price of labor as a result, business people on the island started to import large numbers of immigrants. One of the countries that they took a large number of immigrants from was India. Between the arrival of the first group of Indian indentured workers in Jamaica in 1845 and the final groups that returned to India in 1929, nearly 37,000 Indians were brought to the island to work as indentured laborers. This in turn had the effect of forcing the price of labor down. Resentment started to breed between the new immigrants and the more established groups of people living on the island. The planters benefited from all of this tension because it kept everyone on the island distracted while they enjoyed the benefits of an ever-increasing labor pool. Generally, the conditions were depressing. Low wages, terrible natural events like the drought, super high immigration, and low expectation of good economic prospects for the future. All of this, of course, had some expected effects. There were widely reported incidents of larceny or stealing. In addition to the increasing prevalence of stealing, the island's jails were becoming rapidly overcrowded. The prison population had almost tripled, going from 283 inmates in 1861 to 629 inmates by 1864. By 1865, in the months leading up to the Marant Bay Rebellion, the prison population had grown to 710 prisoners. 616 of those were locked up for theft of personal property. The residents of the island were, of course, displeased with their political representation and unhappy with the direction which their lives had taken them. Still, every now and then, there would be a glimmer of hope 
beginning of 1865, something was about to happen that would cause people to think that their plight was finally being heard and taken seriously by someone with the power to help them. This was the Underhill Letter. In January of 1865, Edward Underhill, who was then the secretary of the Baptist Missionary Society, wrote a letter to the Secretary of State for the colonies. It painted a harsh picture and laid out the real raw truth about what was happening on the island. He directly addressed the lack of employment available for the residents of the island, saying that they were forced to either, as he put it, steal or starve. He also criticized the incredibly high taxation regime that they were under. The letter discussed why it was short-sighted and harmful to deny the residents of Jamaica political rights, shutting them out from the governance of their own island. He even went as far as criticizing the way all the authorities were handling the waves of immigration that they had started. The letter pointed out the limited ability of the farming industry to provide employment, showing that much wider investment would be necessary to provide employment to over 130,000 adult working age unemployed men. The Underhill letter emphasized that capitalists from Britain had stopped any further investment into the island. They saw the situation as way too volatile to risk money there. Finally, he made recommendations on things that people on the island could do to stop the crisis from getting worse. But most people missed that part. Instead, his vivid description of the wicked conditions is what generated the strongest response. Reports from Baptist missionaries across the island were dire. One such report from the Baptist Union was as follows. It appears that in some districts, numbers of people are known to walk from 6 to 30 miles in search of work. That numbers even in crop time, applying to the estates for employment, are turned back without obtaining it. That at the present time, in consequence of drought, and, in some cases, from partial cultivation, some estates are working short time. And that in many districts, Creole labor has been displaced either wholly or in part by that of coolies, Chinese and Africans. Other Baptists on the island of Jamaica did not feel the same way. One Baptist missionary in Kingston called Samuel Orton held his own contrary opinions on the cause of widespread poverty in Jamaica. In his view, the people of the island were the cause of their own misfortune. These accumulated evils are to be wholly or principally attributed to excessive droughts, inability to obtain employment, or dear saltfish and calico. The real cause in the great majority of cases is, in my opinion, only to be found in the inveterate habits of idleness and the low state of moral and religious principles which prevail to so fearful a degree in our community. While everyone had an opinion, the real test of whether the things in the Underhill letters were true was how the people would respond to it people across Jamaica would respond by meeting up in public to share how they really felt and to compare notes about just how bad things were. We are calling upon all the descendants of Africa in every parish throughout the island to form themselves into societies and hold public meetings and cooperate for the purpose of setting forth their grievances, especially now when our philanthropic friends in England are leading the way. The Underhill Letters started a series of public meetings and public petitions. The idea, though, was that these meetings provided an outlet for the common man to have their voices be heard, appealing to the authorities for assistance. During these meetings, the colonial government in charge of Jamaica was critiqued, harshly. These meetings were held across the island, from St. James to Clarendon, to Kingston, to Hanover, to St. Thomas. In these meetings, people complained about the crushing high taxes, high levels of unnecessary immigration, and the lack of productive employment opportunities on the island. Blatant corruption was also condemned. 
Other meetings had people who were designated to present the petitions and concerns raised at the meeting to the governor and local leadership. To some extent, the meetings signified that there may be some assistance that could come back from the colonial government. However, all they would receive was a cold shoulder. You see, many of the written petitions that went out after the meetings were sent to Governor Eyre. Governor Eyre was a part of the existing power structure and as a result he couldn't relate to how regular people were living. Regardless of the documented complaints he received, his opinion was that they were the cause of their own problems. He claimed that the island's climate and their natural habits had made them lazy. My own conviction is that the pressure which now undoubtedly exists amongst a portion of the population and which has become intensified during the last few weeks owes its origin in a great measure to the habits and character of the people induced by the genial nature of the climate. The facility of supplying their wants in ordinary seasons at comparatively little exertion and their natural disposition to indolence and inactivity. In St. Anne, the head of the West India Department, Henry Taylor, felt the same way. In spite of the detailed complaints that they received as a result of the public meetings, he still thought that they simply needed to work harder. His opinion was published in a document called The Queen's Advice. The prosperity of the laboring classes as well as of all other classes depends in Jamaica and in other countries upon their working for wages not uncertainly or capriciously, but steadily and continuously, at the times when their labor is wanted, and for so long as it is wanted, and that if they would use this industry, and thereby render the plantations productive, they would enable the planters to pay them higher wages for the same hours of work than are received by the best field laborers in this country. And they may be assured that it is from their own industry and prudence, in availing themselves of the means of prospering that are before them, and not from any such schemes as have been suggested to them, that they must look for an improvement in their condition. The responses that they had received to their nationwide meetings hurt the people on the island of Jamaica. In response to their request for change, they had been told that they simply needed to work harder. 50,000 copies of the Queen's advice had been circulated to all parts of the island. Some people refused to circulate the document, claiming that it had caused an amount of irritation most painful to observe. The colonial government thought that they had enough leverage to ignore the pleas of the local population. However, they had made a strategic misstep. In this time of newspaper mass media and popular unhappiness, it wouldn't take long for bad blood to spread. The people on the island silently took note of the insensitive response to their discomfort. This lit the fuse on the bomb that would eventually explode into the Morant Bay Rebellion. If things do not change, a dire fate awaits Jamaica and her people. The summer of 1865 came, and conditions across Jamaica were just as bad and getting worse. There was still a drought, low wages, and non-existent working opportunities. Everyone was on edge, and the atmosphere began to get spooky. One of the first noticeable events was an anonymous letter discussing a plantation owner. The owner of the Smith Plantation was attacked in the letter which alleged corruption. It accused the owner of the Smith Plantation of illegally keeping a large shipment of rice which had been sent from the Queen of England to the island of Jamaica. He was accused of using this shipment to feed his own workers. Rumors began to percolate, suggesting that Smith's home and plantation were on the verge of being a target for takeover by local rebels. The Costas in charge of St. Elizabeth was also anonymously accused in another letter of keeping a large amount of money for himself which was sent from England for the betterment of the colony. Elsewhere in Black River, rumors of an uprising on August 1st, the anniversary of emancipation, began to circulate. The rumor was that a large number of assailants planned to march to the most important city in St. Elizabeth, which at that time was Black River, and then raid shops and businesses, taking whatever they wanted by force. 
The storekeepers, for instance, said remarks were constantly dropped in their stores, such as when people came to buy a bit of cloth, they would say, you stop, August will soon come, and cloth will be cheap. Instead of fixing the issues that had caused this state of rumors and tension on the island, the local leaders blamed the Underhill meetings and the Underhill letter for creating this state of wild excitement. The general opinion among proprietors white, colored, and black is that all this disturbance and ill feeling is to be attributed to the late assertions which have been made that the Negroes are ill-treated and cheated and unfairly dealt with and oppressed, and that if permitted to be reiterated, there will be no peace or security for property or life. In response to all of this social and political unease, Governor Ear decided to send two warships to affected areas. The first one went to Black River, and the second one went to Montego Bay. He requested that once they got there, they should put on a gun show and flex their military muscle just to show what they were capable of. If the ships were to have a little gun practice in each of the ports, it might be useful in letting the peasantry know of their presence. The event that truly caused the situation to reach its climax happened at a meeting in Vere, Clarendon, where George William Garden, in the middle of a fiery speech, allegedly brought up something that no one wanted to consider. The fact that Jamaica could end up like Haiti if things did not change for the better, fast. I was told by some of you that your overseer said that if any of you attended this meeting, they would tear down your houses. Tell them that George William Gordon said they dare not do it. It is tyranny. You must do what Haiti does. You have a bad name now, but you will have a worse then. Everyone on the island was well aware of the kind of slaughter that had happened in Haiti. From 1791 to 1804, Haiti had been caught up in a 12-year-long war where 75,000 French, 45,000 British, and 12,000 other colonists were killed. Haiti also suffered great losses of over 200,000 fighters, but they also forcibly earned their full independence and complete self-government. Forced to consider that the same thing could happen in Jamaica, local leaders were all of a sudden on high alert. The mere mention of Haiti, with its history of successful slave rebellion, sent shockwaves through the island. Even Gordon's allies were alarmed. Sidney Levine, editor of the County Union, wrote ominously of fearful demonstrations to come. Gordon himself denied ever bringing up Haiti. Whether it was true or not, it completely changed the energy on the island. What happened in Haiti was the elephant in the room that nobody wanted to acknowledge. But it was inevitable, given the conditions on the island. The time for peace had passed. The government would not yield, and neither would the people. Petitioning for help would no longer work. The streets began to whisper. A breaking point was near. Corruption and exploitation had been revealed, and something had to change. The mention of Haiti was like lighting a fuse on a very powerful explosive. By the end of summer that same year, the Morant Bay Rebellion would kick off, setting the stage for a historic bloodletting. <laughs>